Do we want to dive into uh, integration discussion here? Yeah, so I think we had discussed at the very beginning of the podcast how we were going to cover an overview of every application and then start to deep dive into um, the applications we kind of run and support at our Compose. And the first one we picked here is Camboard. So we're going to walk through everything in the Camboard. We're going to dive dive into it here. I think Andrew's going to talk about the application interface and dive into the application. So take us away. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> the meat and potatoes of what I'm going over today is going to be the application interface, how you interface with the application. You know, what are the different screens? What should you be expecting? And 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 how to work with with Camboard yeah. on a day to day basis um, from the interface point of view. Uh, I did look at the deployment configuration page uh, first because that is logically first. We're looking to include a couple of other things in the future. Um, some notes here, you know, changing logo, having pre-installed plugins, different themes and default sure. boards. Uh, that's just not something that's implemented right now, though. Uh, the, the initial deployment doesn't have anything necessarily that you need to set up before you run that deploy. So that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and dive into the interface. So there, there are a couple of major interfaces that are necessary to operate Camboard. Um, those being the dashboard, the main board view, the new task prompt, the task detail page, uh, and then I wanted to say a couple things about mobile access. So let's let's go ahead and dive into the dashboard. Uh, and and I do have, as as we like to do here, uh, screenshots and graphs. So, <laughs> oh, for the podcast, yeah, right. <laughs> as a podcast, I thought that would be more most appropriate. Um, <laughs> the best form of media we can use is pictures and graphs. <laughs> uh, in the documentation, though, it makes perfect sense. There are a couple of different interfaces to get familiar with. Uh, the dashboard one can be considered you, your homepage. By default, it has the list of your projects and the tasks that are assigned to you in those projects. The top section would be just a list of projects that you're involved in. Uh, this would be for easy navigation to one of the other projects, and you can just jump right to it right from your dashboard. You can jump to that board. That'll take you to the main board screen. It'll give you a very, very brief summation of that project from a point of view that you you might care about. But the second part of that is actually the more interesting for me. This is my to-do list. This is where I sit down and I say, what am I doing today? Uh, because this is filtered not by all the tasks I have assigned, because that's like over 200 tasks. So that's not going to be any yeah, kind of helpful. Right. Uh, this, by default, will include uh, the columns, only the columns that are a quote-unquote in-progress column. Given that, I can use this as my to-do list because it, it presents me a what-is-in-progress-right-now listing. It's probably the handiest way to get a really quick rundown of what is to come. Now, the, the sort option, the weird thing about the sort option is I haven't found a way to get it to persist. So, like, if I tell it to default sort by priority, um, I can get it to sort by priority until I refresh the page. The sort option, if you do find yourself faced with a really long list of things, you know, at least there is the functionality there to initially sort it by something. Yeah, yeah. And and a little note here that these tasks should be the ones that you can jump in and work on any time. They should not be waiting on anything. Because once again, you want to use this as your to-do list, your daily, you know, I, I, I can look at this, I can pull up this page at any point in my day and no. say, I've got to spare 5, 10, 20 minutes. What can I jump into real quick? And I can scan the list right. of tasks that are ready for me to do that. The tasks uh, on themselves have details that are roughly equivalent to what is displayed on the task card detail on the board itself. So we're going to dive into the task card detail in a bit. But first, I want to go over the main board view. Uh, so this is this is the typical what people think of when they think of a, a Kanban board, which is a, a board of swim lanes and columns with tasks notes on them. So the, the, the board itself is fairly vanilla in that it has swim lanes, it has columns. Some of the, the things that I found that have been really helpful is collapsing some of those columns and some of the swim lanes. So specifically when I want to focus on what I can be doing at any given time. 
right? I will collapse a subset of the columns available to me. So I would collapse my backlog column because I don't need to see everything that's in my backlog when I'm looking at something to do right now. I would collapse my waiting column and my pending column and my done column because those are yeah. all states where I can't currently jump in to do something immediately. Yeah. It helps declutter the board is yeah. how I look at it. It's a yeah. it's a big declutter thing. We have backlog that just scrolls for days basically. And I, closing it out because I don't need to see it and closing out done because I don't need to see it or not covering it. It's exactly what you said. You need to just be able to jump right into it so you can just see what's basically – in your in progress yeah and that that is my day-to-day view that's exactly what i need to focus on when i'm sitting down or well as my case may be standing up to do some work and then for each task on that board uh they have a lot of things really crammed into their their representation on the board and and i just went ahead and detailed all these out here yeah the documentation is great I'd highly recommend checking it out because the pictures are great and everything is clearly documented. Obviously, it's a little bit hard to go over on the podcast, but we can at least provide the content that's there. And yeah, I I, I tried to I tried to choose one of my busiest tasks to just to run it down in in no particular order. It has its number, its title, its assignee. It has its category, its due date, its complexity. Uh, it has the comments, the subtasks, the reoccurrence, uh, the duration, and the priority. So all of this, all of this is represented clearly and effectively on the task. So, you know, hats off to the, the creators of, of Camboard maintainers because they, they do do a great job at differentiating stuff. For instance, the, the due date has a little calendar by it. Uh, it also changes color to red when it's past the due date. The priority and the subtasks and the comments all have little icons next to them which indicate uh, what they are. And, and they will always show up in the same place too. Um, now, the cool thing about this, and I might add it to the documentation, but... A lot of those things are clickable inside of the task. Obviously, the task gets clicked and dragged, you know, between columns, sure. between states and swim lanes. But the the actual representations of the things on the columns can be clicked. For instance, if you click the comments, the little comment bubble um, or the number of, of how many comments there are, that will actually pop up the comment dialog where you can you can add a comment or look at the previous comments without having to go into that actual task detail. Uh, the same thing with the subtasks. And even there's a little edit button right next to the assignee name. And you can actually bring that up and edit stuff in the task like the category or the assignee, or anything else, like I said, without having to dive into the task detail page. So I think it's it's really handy uh, as a as a high level overview where you need to you need to sit down and you're like, all right, I need to manage what I'm doing. If you have a quick question about you know what was the last comment on this, I can bring that up fairly quickly without losing my place on the board. Right, it's right in front of you, and that board. The, it's a good thing you mentioned. This, so the, this is just on the main board view is uh, basically where I'd go with it. And there's a lot a lot of information just condensed in there. It's really easy to see without diving into the task detail, all the information you might you know need to know about about the task. Well, and, and one of my favorite things that I've been starting to pay more and more attention to is the duration field. So there's, there's actually two yeah. numbers in the duration field. It's the duration since it was created and the duration that it's been in the column that it's in. So you can see... How long ago did I, you know, come up with this idea versus how long has this been sitting here or how long has this been right. waiting? Something like that. I'm actually just going to keep steamrolling forward here and uh, take a look at, you know, what it what it takes to create a new task. So there are a couple ways to create a new task. My typical way of doing it is next to every column name um, on every swim lane is a little plus sign that will pop up a, a way to create yeah. a new task. Yeah. However, in almost all of the the pages here, on the top left, there's a gear icon that will drop down, and you can create a brand new task using that drop down. If you use the gear icon on the top left, it will try to default, I think, to the very top left of the board. So in this case, it would be the backlog in emergency. But either way you go about doing it, you're going to have a, a new task prompt with just a whole bunch of fields to fill out. 
a lot of information in there, uh, but I'd even say a lot of it is optional. The only thing that's required is the title of the task. Now, everything can be changed after the task is created, so there's no need to actually worry about getting this right the first try. Uh, nothing is nothing is permanent, and, and the rest of it can be filled in later if necessary if you just don't have that information. Um, I, Jack and I change the titles of our tasks all the time based on scope creep and, and whether we need to redefine what what's actually going on with with what we needed it to be. There, there are things on here, I believe, though, that are more important than others. So, for instance, the title obviously is very important. Uh, the description as well sure. is something. And, and we went over this when we were talking about the Indeed. overview as to, like, what yeah. needs to go into the description. We need, you know, why are we creating this task? You know, what does this task look like when it's going to be done? And, you know, how should we approach um, implementing this this fix or, or 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 working this task, yeah. So having that in the title and description is a very very good first step. Um, a couple other things that I usually pay attention to: uh, the assignee obviously is going to be a key one. If you're using just a personal board, I mean that's going to be a no brainer. But if you're on a team or, or working with someone else, then yeah, you're going to want to make sure that that assignee gets populated. So I even have a comment on a personal board. I, I t even tend to uh, sign myself on the personal board just because if I don't assign it, sometimes it won't show up in that main page and I won't see the task or I don't, it, it's a weird kind of, it's, it's unassigned and I'm the only person on that board, but it's something I guess I've just kind of ingrained in myself now to automatically assign it to me for just for visibility. And so I can see it, I guess. You can actually set the swim lane and column in here. So if it defaults to the emergency backlog, like it does if you, you choose it from the main page, you can change that there. The category obviously is going to be what you set up on your board. And I'm not going to dive into what categories need to be right now. I, th I think we kind of touched that back in the first cam board episode. There, there are a couple different ways to set up categories, uh, but this presents a drop down here, which is super nice. So I don't have to keep those all in my head and remember them. The only other two things that I really play around with a lot on this new task page are due date and complexity. I, I was going to say, I love, I, I will add complexity to all the tasks just so I'm like, well, this is, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not diving into something that I thought was going to take five minutes is now taking three hours. I, I at least can. Yeah kind of brace brace myself for the the time i'm gonna spend yeah absolutely uh and then the other thing here to touch on would be the due date field if it's unset it will show the current time if you set the due date and then need to unset it it is actually as simple as deleting that entire field like you would just highlight everything like you would highlight a block of text and just backspace it right out and, and usually I don't set due dates unless I do have a hard due date. Uh, that's more of a philosophical discussion. Uh, but if, if you're someone who, who likes to have arbitrary due dates or like I would, I would much rather have it by this time, um, that also does allow it to be set up on the calendar too. So if you're more of a calendar person, you want everything on there, um, you can make the due date whatever you want it to be. You can make it the day that I want to, you know, have this either done by or the day that this is happening. Uh, keep in mind, there is also the start date, uh, which will also show up on your calendar. So if you need it to to remind you to start something or that you're currently working on that, you can set the start date and the due date separately. Jack, what do you feel about tags? So there is a gray area for me between categories and tags. I'd say categories are, I would even put it as a project, like an overarching project or I guess a group. And I guess tags would be a subset of the category almost. So we have infrastructure as an example, uh, you know, versus business versus tooling versus I forget what the sales out there. And so that's, you know, fine. That's the category. I, I, I'd go further with the tags and just break it down even more. Um, so a lot of the tags I use are for like uh, command center all use as a tag, like, Hey, this is part of the command center app or, Hey, this is part of the portal application. And, um, it can stretch across categories. So like tooling we have, so I had to set up CI CD for both command center and portal. I'd say, uh, I tagged it portal, but it was part of tooling, uh, infrastructure it's out there. Uh, I didn't really have to, I don't, I don't think I had anything in the infrastructure category, but essentially I would tag it portal and say, Hey, well, we need to deploy this on a new instance or, you know, application it's tagged portal or command center. That's a lot of what I use tags for i don't know what are your thoughts on them 
the best breakdown I've heard is to use categories as almost like a who am I representing at this point? Because obviously, as a small business here, we have to wear a lot of different hats. You know, right. We have to wear the business hat. We have to wear the technical architect hat. You know, we we've the sales hat. We we've, we've got a lot of different things that we need to wear, right? And the mindset that I need to be in to do that in Hask is the category I typically will will place it in. That's why we have different stuff for the podcast, different stuff for the business, different, you know. So so we we, we kind of separate those out. Whereas if we were to, you know, thinking way down the road, if we were to be looking to build out the company, we would have the different sections and could start to identify, you know, what really needs to to get focused on. I thought that was a great overview of the categories. What would you say for the tags? The tags are going to be any anything that's a subset of that. Like, honestly, it's okay. I, I started okay. out using okay. it for uh, like version numbers. I was like, you know, it, let me let me take this as a 2.0 when we were working towards that. And I say this is required to get to a yeah. 2.0 state. Um, and then I would also tag it with like the uh, application name. So like. Uh, I have a I have a category of of services when I'm working on adding new services or fixing stuff in services, and I would tag something as uh, blog if it was one of the blog generators. Like so, in my backlog in the services category, I've got Hugo, I've got WordPress, I've got you know there there are different subsections of services uh and then also if i have like a specifically jekyll fix to do something right um i will i will actually put jekyll in the in the tag as the actual specifically yeah. application it could be used for for so many different things it's i call tags very loose i i, I think what you want to avoid doing is is making that any kind of rigid tags need to be yeah tags need to be very fluid and they need to be organic uh, and I, I the the real benefit there is that when you when you start doing reporting then you can start looking at tags and saying do i see a trend in these tags and you have to let something organically develop from the tags whereas the categories right. need to be up front and figured out first and, and this does give a, a bit of autonomy to people too because so they can experiment with different ways to, to tag things and you can also go back and tag things retroactively if you need to so it's it's not that big of a deal if you you know quote unquote mess up but i think i think the most important thing here is that this needs to be this tag field needs to be organic and also i'd say avoid the spray because you can just spray everything with tags because if you have a bunch of tags out there just so you have a bunch of tasks and then you just spray them with tags. I, I guess you could kind of correlate them all together. For boards like the one you and I are working on or my own personal board, yeah, that, that spray is just going to get annoying and it's going to yeah, be a right. restriction <laughs> that I impose on myself and then I'm not going to follow it. So then no one on the board is following it. It just doesn't make any sense, right? It's out there, right. So at, at that point, and I say organic, but I, I, I mean that you have to be a little bit more a little bit thoughtful, right, in, in how you put it in. You, you can't just spray it. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. That's what I was getting at. It's got to be or, it's organic, but you can't just, all right, well, let's toss everything, every single keyword I can think of on this right now. Yeah, it's exactly. Just... Exactly. That's not going <laughs> to help comes... anybody. Yeah, right, right. You're, you're, you're sitting through, like, filtering out tags, like, oh, wait, this does this, this does this. I need, you know, I don't know if there's any kind of rule for this, but I usually do one to two tags if it if it fits it fits if it doesn't it doesn't i'm not sitting there you know tagging every task with 50 tag 50 tags or whatever but yeah if if it's helpful right and and it may not be helpful in which case don't worry about it like it's right for it's an option for me I, I i'd say i'd say it's much more important to get your categories right and to get it so that yeah. it, it benefits uh, your workflow, especially if you're prioritizing, you say, hey, I want to work on some of the business stuff this week. I can go into my categories. I can start filtering by by my business category yeah. and saying, hey, these are the things that I've identified that I need to prioritize now. So that that makes it easy for me without having to worry about necessarily the, the tagging until I get to the point where that's something that I I think is going to benefit me in the long run. And then speaking of tasks, you know, just diving into the, the task detail page. And this is, this is where you go after you create a task. Uh, this is, this is the representation of the task. This is where you can do everything in, in the task and where you can change anything in that task that you had set up previously. 
I love, I actually love Canboard's um, implementation of the task detail page uh, as compared to Jira or honestly, I've used only Jira and Canboard as boards. I haven't, I haven't touched or messed with deck at all in Nextcloud. What about Trello? Uh, I've used it a little bit, not, ex not extensively. Uh, I've been in it, I've touched it, but past creating, you know, a title and a description and moving it across the board, I haven't really messed with the comments features and I can't really talk on it, but I love Canboard's task detail page and yeah, all I, the information I, that it provides. Uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very well laid out. Uh, I, I always get the feeling of, uh, power. Like I, I feel like it's very powerful. Like it's, it's very straightforward, easy to use and, and can really do everything that I need it to. And it's simple too. It's yeah. not, you're not lost in buttons and widgets and this and that. And it's, everything's right there. Yeah. So, and, and just to dive in here, there, there are a couple of, of major things that I use probably more than others, you know, just to, just to highlight those. So the, the test detail page is the, the page that I have whenever I'm working on the task itself. I usually have it up. I have it in a new browser window just because that's the way I like to, to organize stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I like to have, you know, my one task, um, and my one task dictates everything that's inside of that window should be related to that one task. Um, so this, this, Task detail page gives me access to all my notes, links, and any other details about the tasks that I've collected so far. Uh, now, the the middle part of it is all the representation and all the interactive bits of it. I'm actually going to skip most of that and, and hop right over into the left-hand side column because that's where the real power functionality sits. So there, there are many different actions on the left-hand side that you can perform. Um, to, to run through the ones I use most of the time. The first one is, is edit the task. Uh, and that allows me to go back into that new task prompt page view that I was just at when I created the task. And I can change any of the details there. So I can change the category. I can change the title. I can change the description, anything in there. That's where I would go to change those things that I set up at the very beginning when I created the task. The next thing is adding a subtask. And I know we haven't necessarily talked about subtasks. I think they are very, very handy. Not necessarily to track uh, separate individual pieces of work, but uh, like if I need to be reminded about something or if I have a I'll get to that later kind of approach to something inside of that task, I'll jot it down as a subtask. Uh, yeah, I think the great example for subtasks that we have is uh, the show, everything that goes on with the show, and the post-editing. It's one task that says, "Hey, we need to, you know, deploy the show." But it's mo it, it's very easy to say deploy the show and then e leave it at that. But there's like eight things that ha that need to happen for us to deploy the show, and having those as subtasks, I think, is a great example. Yeah, and and I think that works perfectly. Uh, now, besides editing the task and adding the subtask, there are a couple more things that I use day in and day out on this task detail page. That would be uh, adding an external link, uh, just going sequentially down the left-hand side column there. Uh, this allows me to grab anything outside, any kind of blog post, any kind of Wikipedia entry, whatever I need that is going to relate to this page and help me you know, figure out or, or yeah. if I found something, I will make sure to link it in the external link fields. The next one right below that is adding a comment and it's really easy to paste a link into a comment as well. Now, if you have 50 or 60 comments, it may be pretty hard to wade through that, whereas the external links are just sitting there right at the top. Uh, makes that a little bit more convenient if that's something that you, you, you know, you're concerned about. Otherwise, uh, you know, and, and this is, this is a fight I have with myself too. It's like, I, I, I could do it the quote unquote correct way, which is to add an external link. But sometimes, man, I'm yeah. just in a rush and just toss it in there. It's like it, it, it doesn't hurt anything, right? The functionality yeah. is there only if it helps you. You don't need to use this if it doesn't help you. Yeah, right, right. I love external links, especially for uh, a lot of what we do is, you know, GitLab based. So it's, yeah. you know, hey, look at this PR, look at this, review this code. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with using the comments, you know, linking via comments, but I, I love the external link. It's got its own section. You don't have to dig through the comments to find out what link you need. It's at the top of the page. Yep, exactly. Adding a comment the very first time, you need to actually hit the add a comment button. Um, and then any 
other time, you're going to see at the very bottom of the page, it's just going to be a text box that you can just start typing in and click, yeah. you know, add or whatever. And, and that'll, that'll save your comment. So that's, that's really convenient as you go through these tasks and create, you know, keep creating comment after comment. Um, but the very first one, you do actually have to click that add a comment button. And then the last one that I wanted to point out here is move position. So this is actually a way from inside of the detail page that you can simulate dragging and dropping the task around the board. So you can actually move the swim lanes from you know one to the other, or you can move column states from one to the other uh, using this move position uh, detail page. And that will that will pop up the prompt where you can you can then move it. And, and to piggyback off of that, I find that uh, super helpful when I'm on mobile to get to my last section here. So specifically for that, um, mobile doesn't support the drag and drop functionality from within the, the main board page. So it, okay. you can navigate around the board, but you can't drag and drop from there. Um, so what you would do if, if you need to to change the state of a task, you'd actually go into that task and then select that, that move position and then use that to actually move the position of the board. And, and this is really one of the main points I wanted to make about mobile. Only use mobile to work on a specific task. Do not use it as your resource to organize your board. Yeah. It's unfit to do so. Um, and, and that's why I, I stress that when you need to jump into something, use your dashboard. Right, because the dashboard is a is a great page on mobile, and it'll take you exactly to the task that you need to do on mobile, and then you can make comments and you can do whatever you want uh, on on there. Right, I wouldn't use it to manage your board. Like I say in the documentation here, this isn't just a rip on the software. Any type of board system is meant to be managed with a significant amount of space to work with, and requires enough viewing area to make out the details that are crammed into each of those task cards, and the flexibility that a point-click drag system can afford. You can use the interface to navigate around a project board like I was talking about before, yeah. but I would not recommend using it as your primary means to curating the overall board, right? So when using mobile, you're best served by keeping to your dashboard and specific task cards themselves. Totally agree. This doesn't preclude you from creating new tasks or going in and adding comments uh, to, to old tasks. Actually, this is probably my favorite note system because if if I have a, a, a task doing something and, and I want to take notes on it, it's as easy as, you know, pulling up a, a card and, and adding a comment right, you got right it. on there. Okay. Yeah, it's it's super simple. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it to, like, say, sit down in the morning and say, all right, let me drag this over here and that over there and this over, you know. Sure. Doesn't right. work like that. Just Just doesn't work like that. The, the other point I wanted to make is that on the task detail page, the comment section is still part of the main section, which is displayed first. So if you have a lot of comments, you're going to have to scroll all the way down. You're going to have to fling and, and, and get to the very <laughs> bottom of the page scrolling, yeah. in order to get to any of the actions, like adding an external link or, or moving the position. It's going to be all the way at the bottom. It's not going to be on the side like it is on the desktop. Um, but it, it is there. Like all, all the functionality is there and available to you. Uh, it's just in a mobile layout. And I, from what I understand, there that was a conscious decision to make it a mobile web page. The web page is going to be the most supported um, on mobile. Anything, anything else to add? I think I said earlier that this interface is powerful. And it, it takes a couple things to be powerful. One, you have to have a lot of options available to you. And two, they have to be easily understood or and and accessible right and and having canboard being coded in php and not having a lot of fancy css or javascript on top of it it is fairly straightforward that's what i like about it yeah it's it's what we've all kind of come to understand is what is a text field you know what is a button there's no kinds of surprises here everything is laid out and and represented exactly how it should be and and that makes the user experience it it may not be the prettiest right but the user experience is spot on that one word description powerful love it well um speaking about powerful 
some kind of segue. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, at this point, I'll, Jack, I'll go ahead and, and turn this over to you. Um, I, I think we, we covered everything that we needed to in, in Camboard today. Uh, okay. And then we, we, we will continue on uh, down this road. I think I think this is a good plan to, to keep keep going on it. Yeah. Hopefully we can kind of keep these in, in, in the forefront of our minds here so that we can keep going back and referencing more of this stuff as we go forward on this.